everybody. Welcome to Care Connection, the free live webinar for family and professional caregivers of individuals living with Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. My name is Christy. I'm from AFA, and I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. Just a couple of things before we get started. All participants will be in listen-only mode throughout the course of this webinar. If you have any questions, you can type them into the questions box on the right side of your screen in the control panel, and we'll have time for questions at the end of the presentation today. Uh, we also have the PowerPoint available for download in the handout section if you would like that for your own use. And today we have a very special guest speaker, Sharon Denny from the Association for Frontal Temporal Degeneration. Um, and so that's what she's going to be talking about today, and we're really excited to have her as our guest. So, Sharon, whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and get started. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, and certainly thank you for the invitation to be with you all today. Um, I, as Christy said, I will be giving you an introduction to frontotemporal degeneration, which, as the title slide describes, is a complex disease with complex care needs. And so I do encourage you to refer to the handouts as a, um, a resource because we're gonna try to cover a lot of information. So here we go. Our objectives today are to identify the signs and symptoms of the three main FTD clinical syndromes, to describe FTD research activity and opportunities for participation, and to identify the impact of FTD on families and the need for specialized education and support. So frontotemporal degeneration is, it is a term that describes a progressive disease of the frontal and or temporal lobes of the brain. And as you'll quickly come to appreciate, this is a really complex and a very heterogeneous group of disorders. So FTD is the most common form of dementia under age 60. However, the, while the average age of onset is 58, or right in the mid 50s, there's a wide range. People have been diagnosed as early as in their 20s or as late as in their 80s. So while the average is in the mid 60s and the most and most cases of FTD are in that range, there are some, there's variability in the age of onset. Prevalence is really hard to estimate because as you'll hear soon, there's still some challenges in diagnosing these disorders. But the best estimate that we have right now is from 50 to 60,000 people in the US affected or about 20 people per every 100,000. Um, and again, the, there are various clinical presentations of FTD. We're gonna focus today on the three main types which present with changes in behavior, language or movement. And while memory can be impaired, FTD is not primarily a memory disorder. So this is a, a complex group of overlapping disorders. There's a wide range of symptoms and expressions of them possible in terms of the clinical presentations. There are multiple pathologies underlying what those symptoms, the symptoms that we can see and evaluate in the clinic. And some of the pathologies are uh, tau, TDP43, and FUS. And these refer to proteins that occur normally in the brain but when disease begins, they uh, start to misfold and clump up in the brain and cause um, nerve cell death, which is what leads to the degeneration or the loss of brain tissue and therefore the extension of symptoms. There's also complex genetics associated with these disorders. And what's listed here on your slide are three of the most common genetic mutations that can happen in FTD. And we'll talk more about that later as well. And then as you might guess, the rate of progression is also variable across the disorders under this umbrella, which makes it difficult for even the most um, expert physicians to predict too much in terms of what is any one individual's experience going to be. So a little bit about the genetics. So roughly about 40% of FTD is familial. Um, this is a, a much greater proportion in terms of the impact of genetics then on Alzheimer's disease. And so when we say familiar, it breaks down into a couple of different categories. So from the best information that we have right now, about 15 to 20% of FTD cases are dominantly inherited. So if a parent is affected, each offspring has a 50% chance of inheriting the disease. Another 20 to 30% are familial, where there's some higher risk or evidence in the family history 
of another type of neurodegenerative disease or FTD, but there's been no known gene responsible for that that's been identified. And then really research is showing that still over half of the cases of FTD are sporadic where there is no known familial influence. But this 40% is significantly higher than in Alzheimer's disease. And so this becomes a, a driver of research that's becoming increasingly valuable in understanding these disorders. So if we put these two side by side, FTD and Alzheimer's disease, the age of onset is significantly younger for FTD. Our best estimates say there's a significant difference in prevalence, although the FTD numbers are really considered to be a, 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 an underestimate but with challenges in diagnosing, we just don't know how much. Certainly it would be less common than all, Alzheimer's disease. The clinical hallmarks, again, are behavior, language, and movement changes. 10 to 20% is dominantly inherited, whereas less than 1% of Alzheimer's disease is. And then the time to diagnosis right now, the best estimates for folks with FTD is about 3.6 years until folks get a clear diagnosis of an FTD disorder and Alzheimer's disease is um, about a year less. So what are the syndromes that we're talking about? FTD or frontotemporal degeneration is an umbrella term for a spectrum of diseases. The naming is cumbersome as you can see from this slide and there are multiple subtypes, um, each with variable symptoms and a variable disease course. So we're gonna dig in a little bit more to this pretty complicated slide. So behavioral variant FTD, is the most common subtype of the FTD spectrum diseases. And behavioral variant FTD might also be known as Pick's disease or frontotemporal dementia. So the, in terms of the naming and the evolution of our understanding of these disorders, some of these previous terms were used. Right now, clinically, the behavioral variant FTD is the most common diagnosis that people see, being seen at a specialty clinic would be receiving. And this type of FTD, this presentation, is marked by changes in cognition, the increased disinhibition, inflexibility, and decreased insight. And again, we'll dig in further on these in a little bit. The second group of subtypes that I wanna introduce you to is called primary progressive aphasia. And again, you can see here, there's three different subtypes of primary progressive aphasia. This is when the earliest and the most prominent symptoms that are identified are changes in language. Um, and there can be three different types of language impairment that begin to show up that might lead someone towards a diagnosis of primary progressive aphasia. Over here on the right, you'll see that there's two related movement disorders under the spectrum, and they're named cortical basal syndrome and progressive supranuclear palsy. These also have cognitive impairment to some extent, as well as different types of movement and motor symptoms that might be apparent in evaluation. And then over here all the way on the left is the ALS spectrum, ALS FTD spectrum disorders. And there is a portion of FTD where we see the combination of the muscular deterioration of ALS or motor neuron disease and people who meet the criteria for um, FTD. And again, we'll come back to this a little bit more closely in a bit. So some of the changes that um, are happening when the frontal lobes and the temporal lobes of the brain are impaired by disease are cognitive changes. So memory is relatively spared, but we do see changes in attention, making and carrying out plans and a person's ability to engage in flexible thinking or reasoning. And so some of the things that you might see is uh, people who really can't attend to or watch movies or read books the way that they did before. They may have difficulty following conversation. Um, there might be an increase in sort of purposeless or, or, or more apathetic kinds of activities. They're not able to pay attention and engage the way they had previously. Um, people, in terms of being organized in their thinking, work difficulties are often common and an early sign of changes. People may have problems with planning and organizing their work or feedback is taken differently. Their task completion skills change. Um, in the home, you might see troubles with paying bills or cooking and these um, fairly routine tasks for somebody um, are much harder to complete. And then there's a sense of mental rigidity or uh, people who become more insistent on having things a certain way and the flexibility in their thinking isn't as um, strong as it used to be. 
So when we look particularly at behavioral variant FTD, which again is the most common of the subtypes, what we see are changes in behavior and personality. So this is sometimes known as a disorder of social comportment, a person's social interactions change. The behavioral dis disinhibition that's common, again with damage in the frontal and temporal lobes of the brain, and in particular certain circuits within the frontal lobes, you might see socially inappropriate behaviors, a loss of manners or decorum, People might become more impulsive or rash or careless in their actions. Um, some people become very apathetic. They lose interest in activities and um, become much less active than previously. There's a loss of empathy. Um, the disease in this part of the brain causes people to have difficulty putting themselves in the shoes of another person. Um, it's a symptom of the damage that's happening at, at the, the level of the disease. Perseverative and compulsive behaviors are common in behavioral FTD. There's often changes in diet or oral behaviors. Sometimes people become very interested in eating one type of food or they eat more sweets. And then we'll also see impaired judgment, ability to think ahead, and um, reasoning skills. So what you might see when we're talking about changes in behavioral FTD or changes in the social brain, people will tell us, you know, I, I had a sense I don't know who this person is. I've been married to my spouse for a number of years, but this is not the same person that I married. And they really try to understand what is it that's causing these changes. There may be a loss of interest in family and friends, um, a lack of concern over a, an illness in the family or a death that's very atypical or very unusual from how the person would have responded before. There may be an increase in self-centered kinds of actions, um, impulsive spending. So there's an, an impairment to the person's judgment of not recognizing that buying five new cars in a short period of time is not a necessary behavior. Um, people become more vulnerable to scams. Um, there's a, a, a common symptom where people might be inappropriate about touching things or using things. They might touch a stranger's hair or take food off someone's plate. And again, these are socially inappropriate behaviors that are a result of the disease. Some people experience delusions or changes in their thinking around religion and those kinds of things that might be apparent as well. So compulsive behaviors, they could be either motor, motor things like hand rubbing or clapping. Um, sometimes it's a verbal behavior that becomes repetitive and gets kind of stuck. It could be counting loud or humming. These are all things that might be um, evident, usually in the mid stages of the disease, but potentially early on too. Some folks will develop routines, motor routines that are pretty complex, but they do them over and over again. They might walk a fixed route. They might start collecting or hoarding objects. Um, they might uh, sort of obsessively count money and check things over and over again. And then as we mentioned, the narrow food preferences are common and the loss of self-awareness. There's a, a difficult term, anazognosia, refers to this loss of the ability to monitor your own behavior, to not be aware of the changes that other people become increasingly aware of. In primary progressive aphasia, we're really looking at early and progressive changes in language skills. Um, and again, memory, and in this case, self-awareness are relatively preserved. So folks with PPA um, generally are aware of the loss of their language skills uh, which can add to some of the emotional impact of the disease early on. So the three types are agrammatic PPA, where people develop problems in expressive language, semantic PPA, where there's a loss of word meaning, and then logopenic PPA, where there's an impaired word retrieval issue that can be identified with the right types of evaluation. The movement disorder, so PSP, um, is generally recognized by balance or unexplained falls, slower stiff movements, and there's a very uh, significant symptom within PPA that is often uh, helpful in making this diagnosis, which is a distinct trouble coordinating eye movements um, or a downward gaze that physicians can identify. And then cortical basal syndrome or also cortical basal degeneration is marked by slow or reduced movements, a certain rigidity in the physical um, gait and, and walking of the person. Um, apraxia, which is sort of a loss of um, coordinated movements, and then limb and fine motor control issues. And finally, the ALS-FTD spectrum disorder 
Um, this is an area of active research and, and where we're really learning a lot, both on the ALS side and the FTD side, that there's a cognitive impairment is present in many people with ALS to varying degrees, however. So there seems to be about 20% of people with ALS or motor neuron disease who would meet the criteria for having a dementia, for having behavioral variant or PPA. Um, and those are the folks we're talking about here in this overlap area. In 2011, there was a gene mutation that was identified to link ALS and FTD. And that's what you see here, the C9ORF72 gene, which um, currently is thought to account for about 11% of those people who have a familial FTD case. And then here, as you might expect, you see uh, evidence of muscle weakness, muscle atrophy that go along with the ALS or the motor neuron disease, as well as the symptoms of PPA. Um, the course of this tends to be faster, um, and the care needs are especially complex because of the combination of the physical deterioration of the muscles, as well as the cognitive impairment from the FTD. So diagnostic challenges. Um, one of the things that happens is that there's a very gradual onset of symptoms for most people, um, and they start at a younger age. So this combination means that many of the early symptoms and signs are missed or dismissed. We think of people who are showing some changes in their decision-making um, or less interest in, in activities that they used to be interested in is maybe depressed. Um, sometimes people are diagnosed initially with bipolar disorder or Parkinsonism. So there's a period of time that families experience and the person developing the disease experience where they may sense that things are changing, but they're going down different routes that are looking at um, perhaps uh, mental health disorders, adjustment disorders, difficulties at work, and not necessarily getting the right type of evaluation. At some point, there's a tipping point and families will describe, that's when I knew there was something seriously wrong. And that's what often prompts further action or um, persistence to get to the right type of evaluation for diagnosis. So the clinical diagnosis is made based on the person's history and the examination. And so there really aren't any biomarkers where people can't take a blood test or there's no individual test that can say, we know for sure this is FTD. And so within that context, the evolution of the changes that the individual and their family are noticing is really important to bring to the doctor. The change from prior, prior functioning is often the, the key indicator that there's something wrong. Added to that then is neuropsychological testing, which can be very helpful to identify the parts of the brain that are intact and working well and parts where there's an unusual decline in a person's ability. Brain imaging is increasingly important as a part of the evaluation process, whether it's an MRI or a PET scan. Uh, CSF or cere cerebral spinal fluid studies are generally not helpful in diagnosing FTD, except that they can be helpful to rule out Alzheimer's disease. And so the diagnostic process for FTD is very often one of ruling out other things that might be treatable or that might be more identifiable, and then looking and digging further to make sure that we can hone in on really what is happening here. Genetic testing is not done for diagnosis, but if a person is diagnosed and is symptomatic, genetic testing might be helpful for the understanding of that family in some circumstances um, and for counseling, but not for diagnosis. So what are the care needs and support needs that we're talking about? The impact on the family system is quite different if we're talking about developing a dementia when you're under 60 versus later on in life. So again, it's this idea that for many people, they've been coping with symptoms before they were diagnosed and before they really understood what it was that's affecting changes in their family or that's caused loss of employment in many cases. Relationships become strained and broken. Um, there is a significant number of people that we talk with who have gone through a divorce before an actual diagnosis was made. And these are adding, you know, compounding the difficulty that f people face. Loss of employment, again, if you're in your 60s, you're often at the peak of your career. And so losing employment there uh, is devastating on the family from a financial standpoint. It's also especially difficult on the person with disease who has had a productive, engaged career and loses that routine, that aspect of their personality and their identity at an early age. 
people are still physically robust and active, which adds a layer of uh, consideration in terms of treatment interventions. And then folks at this age have fewer comorbid health conditions. And so what we see is the impact of the dementia itself um, as it plays out over time that may not be uh, compounded by other types of health issues, which is often a factor in Alzheimer's disease. So family roles change. Young adults and school-aged children may be needing to take on different responsibilities as caregiving becomes more important. As the disease progresses, the, the role of the caregiver is critical in terms of the quality of life um, and maintaining safety for the person. So behaviors of, especially behavioral variant FTD can be intrusive or embarrassing. You know, the disinhibition can lead to situations that are frankly difficult and uncomfortable for school-aged children at a sporting event or for folks trying to engage in the community and for friends. And so what we see is that with the nature of the changes in a person's behavior and their judgment, there is an increasing level of friends pulling away and a loss of existing social supports that becomes very, very difficult for the family. And folks feel as though really no one understands what they're going through. The symptoms are seen and felt most closely, of course, by those who are closest to the person, but someone with FTD could still be functioning fairly well in some parts of their lives in the community. And the changes that are felt most intimately in the family may not be apparent and often are not apparent to people with whom they engage in a more casual fashion. We also know that in FTD, the economic burden of the disease starting younger is significant. There was a study that was published a couple of years ago based on a survey of about 670 family caregivers. Um, and the results of that survey show us that in the 12 months before a diagnosis was made, most families were reporting an income between 75 and $99,000. 12 months after diagnosis, that income fell as much as 50%. Um, we also know that 37% of caregivers said they stopped working after a diagnosis was made, and 58% of people said that FTD caused their loved one to make poor financial decisions, thereby count, compounding some of this risk. And so in the middle, what you see is that overall, the survey um, supported the economic toll on FTD of families of around $120,000 a year, which is twice the reported economic impact of Alzheimer's disease. So care management challenges. There are no treatments or even clinical care guidelines for FTD at this point in time. Um, there's still a lack of public awareness, which is why webinars like this are so valuable to our community. Um, so folks facing the development of these symptoms that are not generally understood may not be tagged to be pursued within a neurological evaluation process for some period of time. Um, and then you have folks who, who are trying to work with physicians and health providers who in many cases may be learning about the disease the same time the family needs services. Um, similarly, the home and community services available while very good with general dementia understanding, may not understand or know how to apply those same kind of principles to someone with these different behaviors, intact memory, and a younger onset of disease. Um, there's also issues around eligibility for services when people are younger than 65, which is often the case uh, for folks with FTD. And then we know there's research that supports that the presence of behavioral issues also increases the care burden and therefore the need for support um, and assistance for families. And then the lack of medications for cognitive symptoms is also a, a key factor in figuring out the most appropriate care plan for someone in that um, the loss of awareness, that loss of self-awareness and the decline in judgment are not things for which there's medications that could treat um, those symptoms. And so figuring out from early on what are the most appropriate strategies and interventions in order to preserve a person's quality of life and family quality of life when these symptoms are, are cardinal signs of the disease. So if we summarize the experience of people with FTD, we have diverse clinical symptoms, the younger onset, the fact that this is a less common disease, less well known, less well recognized, and not as well understood, the diagnostic challenges, impact on family and friends, and then the complexity of the underlying pathology and genetics and just the overall heterogeneity of the diseases 
they come together for a greater level of care needs. So if isolation and the care burden are higher, what can we do? And again, we'll just sort of look at a little graphic that shows the array of things that are really important. And throughout all of these, tailoring the approaches for FTD is critical. So peer support is very important, awareness of research, advocacy, individualized and coordinated care, and disease education. These on the surface are not significantly different from what anyone with a neurodegenerative disease needs. However, the nature of the FTD experience means that we wanna be cognizant of how can we push the envelope and be able to really look and understand what's the experience that people are facing and how do we tailor these to meet those needs. So personal attention, it's, it's critically important that providers, friends and family stop and pause and listen to the experiences of what folks with FTD and their families and their care partners are telling us. The diagnostic experience that the family has gone through can, can, can has the potential to impact subsequent contacts with care providers. If somebody has been through a prolonged period of misdiagnoses or extensive testing over the course of a number of years, it can be really difficult, of course, to sustain that under the best of circumstances, to sustain that when someone, when the person themselves may not have an awareness that there's anything wrong, can make that a very difficult process for sure. And so we wanna be able to really listen to what was the experience of this family in coming to the diagnosis. Understanding that and, and, and joining with them can really be very helpful as we look at how are they gonna to continue to engage with providers moving forward? How do we help them to process frustration, guilt, or anger even around how they were approaching some of these changes before they knew that they were facing an illness? Um, and again, the idea that many of the relationships may break up and face divorce because of the nature of the symptoms before a diagnosis is made. And so part of honing in on the experience of these families specifically is to really recognize that people are trying to make sense of what's happening as they're experiencing the changes and as they develop and that care providers um, can help to sensitively reframe some of that and help to expand the understanding of degenerative disease that dementia can affect younger folks, um, can be a, a disease that people are living with while they're, you know, they're, they're mobile, they have skills that are intact, they want to be able to participate and contribute, we need to just figure out how to do that and how to help them. Um, helping families to reframe this pre-diagnostic fa diagnostic phase is especially important in terms of processing the emotions and being able to help them be ready to engage with healthcare moving forward for everyone's benefit and to reframe relationships. The relationships change under the, with the, the weight of this disease, helping people to be able to navigate that effectively can make a huge difference in the prognosis in terms of the, their ability to engage with supports and be able to um, focus on quality of life. So disease education is critical. The best intervention is a well-informed and supported person with FTD and care partner. Understanding that these changes are disease symptoms is really important. A lot of times it feels like it's resistance. It feels like it's a lack of cooperation. It feels like it's intentional. None of those things are true. And helping a family to understand that this is the nature of the disease when it's affecting the frontal and temporal lobes of the brain, that it is not willful um, and understanding how that disease process is contributing to the behaviors can help families be in a better position to be able to think about how to intervene. So when folks were able to learn to more um, carefully observe what's happening and describing those behaviors, Providers are going to be helpful in helping to be able to be more helpful in helping to craft what are the most effective interventions. Um, understanding the pathology, the genetics, and the potential for family risk is a factor for folks. It's not going to be the first thing they do. It shouldn't be the first thing they do. But over time, as they're acclimating to a diagnosis, everyone is concerned about what's the chance that my family might be affected by this. So being able to be armed with the tools and the information that would help them to answer that for their particular family is really valuable. And then for everyone to understand how research is advancing and that, that there are emerging clinical trials in FTD and what does that mean again for our, our understanding of the disorder, disorders, for the potential for treatments and for potential opportunities for people to participate should they choose to. 
The idea of FTD specific support is really important. Um, it is a very isolating experience that people have and they don't really fit in support groups for folks who are in their 70s and 80s. They may not fit or feel that, that their own needs are being met if, this, if the support group is mostly really focused on memory impairment or the kind of symptoms that go along with that. So helping people to find support that's matched to what their experience is, is really important. And uh, we find increasingly that people will say that it's most valuable if they can comfortably connect with somebody who's experiencing something similar to themselves. And again, that's not a really um, earth-shaking concept, but helping to execute it is really important because again, it's a less common disease. So finding FTD-specific supports is more of a challenge to begin with. Um, the role of ambiguous loss in FTD is particularly acute. The person is physically here and they may have many areas where they are still um, active and engaged and want to be. And yet the social or the interpersonal aspect is gonna feel different for folks. And so helping a, a, a family caregiver and the person diagnosed navigate that, it's gonna be balanced differently. Um, some people with FTD, with behavioral FTD are aware of what they're losing, many are not. And so again, that individualized attention is really important, but helping people to find support where their experience will be validated and where those, uh, that sharing of particular needs and challenges can happen is really important. We also know that the use of individual counseling and sometimes child and family counseling, depending on the constellation of the family, can be very um, helpful as people really try to find ways of processing the emotional impact as well as be equipped to provide the kind of care and advocacy for the person that they want to do. Quality of life, of course, is key. Um, we do know that there are a lot of folks who are diagnosed uh, with FTD who, who want to be involved, who are able to be involved and who have a tremendous amount to offer. These are also folks making sure that we realize that a, a dementia diagnosis doesn't mean that everything stops right away. Um, people really do want to be able to work with uh, providers and work with family to adjust the expectations, to be able to maximize their engagement, um, to still stay active and involved, to do things differently, and to recognize all of this within the context of the family system where each person's needs are being attended to. Um, for folks diagnosed with FTD to be uh, involved in advocacy, as the woman that you see on your screen is here, um, is really helping us to understand what is the experience of this disease from the perspective of the person with it, which is something that's really emerged most um, actively, I would say, in the last five to 10 years. And before that, we really kind of used that idea that folks aren't aware of the disease as, as too broad of a stroke. And so again, tuning in on what's the individual experience, not being biased too much by the diagnosis is really important for the respect and the dignity that each person should be afforded. And then in terms of specialized care, you know, the Alzheimer's approach, approaches are helpful and necessary from the standpoint of good dementia care, but they're not sufficient. So um, non-pharmacological interventions are definitely the most effective in FTD. Um, the Alzheimer's medications are not indicated. And in fact, in some cases, they are contraindicated. And so where physicians are not necessarily familiar with FTD as a different type of dementia, they may prescribe um, Aricept or Exelon or some of the other FDA approved Alzheimer's medications. But for someone with FTD, they may uh, exacerbate behavioral issues or agitation. And that knowledge alone can be really important in terms of what's the effectiveness of treatment. Um, medications can be used for targeted symptoms. There are medications from the mental health world, from the psychiatric world, that can be used effectively for targeted symptoms to help to reduce some of those symptoms, but they need to be really carefully evaluated in terms of what is the main symptom we're trying to treat and what is the most appropriate medication. They are all off-label. There are no FDA-approved medications um, for FTD. And then safety is a concern uh, as people lose their ability to sort of monitor their own behaviors or make sound judgments. And so we need to always be aware that uh, assessing for safety is critical, both in terms of a person's ability to navigate in the community. Are they safe to be driving? Are they safe to be 
walking unaccompanied if the ability to sort of assess traffic patterns and risk there is impaired, there may be a need to intervene. Certainly in terms of impulsive behaviors and judgment, um, access to power tools and guns and weapons and those kinds of things are things that should be considered and uh, evaluated. A person's behavior, a person's ability to function can vary day to day. And so if today somebody's um, doing well and having a good day, it doesn't mean that tomorrow there might not be something that would prompt an impulsive decision that could have higher stakes. And so again, that's an, an area that the family and providers need to really look at on a regular basis. Advocacy for services is very important in an area where as providers and family together, we can work to try to push the envelope a little bit because for a family trying to do all this advocacy on their own, it's exhausting um, while they're trying to provide care. So the things that need to happen our folks need to be able to build a care team, you know, an, an FTD specialist, a physician who's responsive and listening. Um, palliative care consult can be very helpful in terms of helping to maintain that quality of life focus from the start. Um, OTPT speech, um, these are therapies that can be very helpful in some of the um, situations that folks across the board may face. Certainly in the language disorders, we're seeing an increasing role and an increasing value of speech language therapies for many people, and that evaluation should happen early. Home care, creative companion care, residential options are all important parts of the team, and advocacy and education have to be integrated from the start. Accessing benefits, uh, retirement, short-term, long-term disability, uh, Social Security disability and Medicare, these all become complicated by the lack of clarity around diagnosis often until later on in the disease. The younger age of people makes it harder to get benefits and so there's a real need for ongoing advocacy and partnering with people to help make these things happen um, in FTD that we see differently than some of the other uh, neurodegenerative diseases. And then transitions in care are common and challenging as the disease progresses. And so that's another area for advocacy and assistance in finding the appropriate services. A little bit about research in FTD. Um, the momentum in the science is definitely growing. The finding tests or biomarkers that would help to improve diagnosis is, a, is an important area of research. There's a number of initiatives that our organization's involved in as well as others and um, we're hopeful that moving forward, there'll be some additional technologies and ways to improve diagnosis. Right now, the definitive diagnosis for people can only be made at autopsy. Um, and as the drug development and clinical trials move forward, being able to know with certainty what the pathology is that's causing the disease, that's causing the symptoms, is gonna become increasingly important. And right now we're not able to do that unless there's a mutation that's been identified. So there is activity in drug development and clinical trials. Um, there are different mechanisms that will be needed for each of these different biological subtypes, both in the proteins, the tau, the TDP43, and the progranin mutations. Um, mutation carriers and the C9 mutation carriers are where there is a known mutation, then those folks would have the opportunity to be targeted into the right trials of drugs that would be aimed at those particular types of pathology. Um, as we move forward, but being able to match someone with a clinical presentation with what we know of the underlying cause of disease is one of the critical challenges in research. So the work on biomarkers um, is going on in parallel with work towards um, identifying targets for treatment and moving towards clinical trials. Care and services research is also um, an increasing area of focus. There's a lot of work in the dementia field in general around what are the technologies that can help to improve care and diminish the challenges for care partners. Um, and we're increasingly looking for ways that um, FTD can be a focus of some of that work as well. So participation in, in research is critical. Um, just this year, a very uh, extensive and valuable NIH grant was reauthorized and funded that's called the All FTD. And this is the name given to a consortium of 19 centers in the US and Canada. 
the focus of which are to conduct natural history studies with cohorts of people over time so that we understand better what the development of the disease is, um, to develop a clinical trial network. In all FTD, there is a portion of people who are uh, seen to be sporadic, who do not have a family history, who are, who are part of these cohorts. There's also an arm of all FTD that's specifically looking at those folks who do have a known mutation. And there, the natural history studies can be especially helpful in understanding um, at what point someone with a mutation begins to develop symptoms, begins to develop disease, because ideally as, as uh, treatments come on track, those treatments want to, we would wanna be able to administer those treatments as early as possible in the course of disease and symptom development in order to have the greatest effect. So all FTD is a really critical opportunity for the scientists and the researchers to learn more about the disease, as well as for folks who may be interested to participate in moving that science forward. One of the other main ways that people can participate is through something called the FTD Disorders Registry. This is a HIPAA compliant uh, database uh, that is really trying to bring together information from folks with FTD. There, you know, as a rare disease, numbers matter and being able to learn from and um, bring together a community of people who are facing these diagnoses in order to move the science forward is really important. There's two arms to the FTD disorders registry. One is a contact registry, which means that anyone who is affected by FTD or their family members and caregivers and extended family members can participate, can go and enter their information People who choose to participate in the research registry would go through an informed consent process and could sign up to be um, included in opportunities to participate in research or as clinical trials come on and studies are begin to recruit more um, actively, then the registry would have the potential to reach out to folks and express to them the opportunity for studies that they might be interested in. So at this point, there's over, um, and I'm sure these numbers have changed actually since I, I uh, had captured this slide, but there's over 3,000 people who are participating in the registry now, and we know that um, that's going to continue to grow and add strength to the impact of being able to reach folks interested in, in research and understanding about the disease. So in terms of some of the other resources that we offer um, that are available to folks, I just want to name a couple things. Um, you know, AFTD is the leading national organization and a global leader focused exclusively on the FTD disorders. We provide a helpline. It's really the only helpline that's specifically focused on these disorders. Uh, any call or email that people send us is answered by specially trained staff here in our office. Um, ed disease education, is one of the other things people can find on the website or through different publications that we offer. We are increasing our library of information on care management, how to help manage the symptoms, some of the um, non-pharmacological interventions and avenues for shared knowledge base from the experts or the folks who are facing the disease now. Um, we have a growing array of FTD support groups across the country. Currently, there are over 100 uh, support group facilitators who've been receiving training and support through us. They're running about 80 groups across the country, and more folks are always welcome. If there's an interest in starting a group, we can help you to do that. And then we also provide information, current, reliable, accurate information on what's happening in research. One specific resource that I always like to call out is that we have an initiative for um, professionals and care partners, family care partners alike, who are interested in digging in a little bit deeper on certain care challenges in FTD. So the initiative is called Partners in FTD Care. It is an in-depth look at different care challenges. It starts with a case story. There are concise strategies and tips and side articles all built around one issue. So the example that you see here is an issue that we did on anazognosia or that loss of self-awareness that's common in behavioral FTD. And so it, uh, some of the other ones that we've covered are uh, challenges in making or getting a diagnosis, ALS and FTD, managing apathy, medications and FTD, and then the next issue to come out is specifically looking at the tremendous value that palliative care services can provide to folks navigating this disease over the course of the disease. 
And then just a couple of little commercials for people who might be in a position to and want to get involved around this particular type of dementia. Um, we do an education conference every year. The upcoming conference will be April 17th in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, there is certainly an opportunity for people to come and join us in person, and we will be live streaming that uh, event for the second time, so people will be able to find that online. And then folks who might uh, have an interest or a desire to get involved as a volunteer um, and help to move the needle for folks facing FTD can also find that through us as well. And so with that, I would like to just pause and um, I'm happy to entertain any questions that you have or things that you might uh, want to hear a little bit more about. Great, thank you so much, Sharon. Uh, so if anybody has any questions, you can go ahead and type them into the control panel on the right side of your screen and we'll get to as many as we can. Uh, so the first question we have is, what is an example of a neuropsychological test? An example of a neuropsychological test. So this is usually, in its fullest form, a battery of pencil and paper tests that would be administered by somebody with a background as a neuropsychologist. Um, at its full length, it's about three hours long. Um, it can be a really valuable aspect of the diagnostic process, and it can be a real challenge uh, for people to endure that length of tests. Um, so what they do is the different pencil and paper tests would check different cognitive thinking skills. And in looking then at the array of scores presented over the course of the battery of tests, the um, neuropsychologist is able to see where there are relative strengths and weaknesses in the person's thinking functions. So it may have to do with, some might be memory, some might be language skills that are tested and different types of language skills that are tested. Um, some is mental flexibility. And so there's a, an array of tests like that that are done usually together as a battery um, and interpreted that really are able to kind of dig into what are the functional um, strengths and weaknesses that the person is exhibiting in terms of their skills, uh, their thinking skills. Great, thanks. The next question is, is there an average life expectancy? That's a great question. Um, and then we, we often say there is an average, and the average is not really very predictive or helpful for most individual people. The average is about um, six and a half to seven years, um, but the diagnostic, you know, so from, from diagnosis, but the diagnostic time frame can be so variable that it's difficult to give meaningful um, averages in this disease for all the reasons that we're speaking about. One of the areas of research I think that's encouraging this way is that the researchers are beginning to be able to parse these different subtypes and learn and understand more about them with the hope being to be able to provide and offer families a little bit more information about what they might expect in terms of the progression of the disease or in terms of the course of the disease. And so right now that's still really challenging, but it is an area of research that folks are looking into more. We know there are some differences in the life expectancy of the different types of disorders and being able to articulate them more clearly and transfer that information to families is one of the areas of research and actually why the all FTD networks are important. That's the type of longitudinal information that's gonna be really valuable. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is two parts. Uh, how do we participate in the palliative care session and how do we participate in the conference in April? Oh, thank you for that. So right now the palliative care piece that I mentioned is going to be a newsletter. Um, so anyone who is signed up with us for newsletters, which you can do from our website homepage and signs up for the Partners in FTD Care newsletter will automatically get that. We do always list all these things on our website. And so there is a section on our website that includes all of the past issues of Partners in FTD Care um, that people can access probably the easiest thing is just search actually on the, the web search button and you'd find it there. Um, and really that issue will be, uh, it uses a, an example of a case to jump off of, but then has additional side articles around the uh, value of palliative care in FTD. And what we've learned in the process is that there are a number of dementia um, 
so medical centers working in dementia, a number of places are beginning dementia care, dementia palliative care programs that are trying to hook people up earlier on when they're diagnosed with the idea of consultations at different points along the way to try to help families make decisions, um, navigate difficult decisions and find support and resources. Um, you know, there's no care management, there's no care guidelines in FTD. And so to have a palliative care partner as you're trying to confront some of these questions could be really valuable. Great, thanks. The next question says, you mentioned that FTD occurrences are more tied to genetics than occurrences of Alzheimer's disease. Can you explain this a bit more? Yes, so um, I'm not an Alzheimer's expert by any means, but in Alzheimer's disease, the, I think the number that we have on the slide is that less than 1% of all the people with Alzheimer's disease have a form of disease that's inherited through a dominant mutation, so passed from generation to generation. Um, my understanding is that most of those cases in Alzheimer's disease are in younger onset Alzheimer's disease. Um, but again, that's not my area of expertise. In FTD, what we know is that it's a higher percentage of people diagnosed with FTD who do have a familial cause, a genetic familial cause of the disease. And so that's where the slide breaks down into two different categories. So if we say about 60% of the people have no known family history, if you look back one, two, three generations for the family that you know, you wouldn't see any necessarily um, noticeable other family members who had any type of neurodegenerative disease, whether it's ALS or uh, Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. There's no, um, no reason really based on family history to pursue a genetic uh, concern too much. But very often people will have some red flags in their family history. And so what we know is about 40% of people with FTD have some familial involvement. And so you might see people with uh, other folks in the family tree who had one of these other neurodegenerative diseases. And then that might be worth um, considering talking with a physician about or talking with a genetic counselor about. And within that, we additionally know that there's about 10 to 20% of people for whom a, mut a specific mutation in a gene causing FTD can be identified. Great, thank you. And just to touch on the Alzheimer's aspect of that, uh, you were correct in that the genetic tie to it is generally in the younger onset, which is much more rare than the late onset. Um, if anyone wants to chat more about that, you can give AFA a call and we'd be happy to give you some more information on how the genetics could look for that. Thanks. Sure. Uh, and the next question says, my husband has been diagnosed with FTD. However, because he has a defibrillator pacemaker, he cannot have an MRI or a PET scan to check his brain cells. Is it possible or worth taking a chance to have the brain scan? Or will the doctor simply not do the scan? Mm. That's a really good question. And um, I, I think I would have to punt back to the doctor because the doctor's going to have the full perspective of your family, his, your, in, your history. Um, again, the clinical diagnosis can be made on the basis of family history and then these additional tests where brain imaging is not an option the doctor might be able to consider if there is any reason to try to rule out Alzheimer's disease from a blood test. You know, if there's a question that maybe what's what the symptoms are presenting could be Alzheimer's disease or could be something else, there may be an additional piece that's not brain imaging that could help to clarify the diagnosis through another type of test. Sometimes too, we find that people, um, you know, it is valuable to pursue the diagnosis to the extent that you're able to. And there's a lot of times where people can't pursue the specific test that might bring more clarity. And that's an area too, where some support and guidance around making those hard decisions. Um, you know, if people are far from a clinic, sometimes people might have to travel two or three hours to get somewhere where they could see a specialist and have the type of brain imaging that would be truly valuable. Um, and so there's nothing, you know, the brain imaging can be really helpful to confirm a diagnosis uh, at the clinical level if what they see is a lot of atrophy in certain parts of the brain. They could say, oh yes, this looks like it adds confidence to the diagnosis because we can see 
that the frontal lobes or their temporal lobes are damaged to such an extent that it supports the clinical diagnosis. But there's also plenty of times where that imaging isn't that clear cut. And so folks who've really gone to extensive lengths to pursue that, or certainly in the case where there's risk, it may not actually add that much information to the overall diagnostic picture. And that's a conversation that you would really have to have with the physician. Great, thank you. The next question says, what are some of the differences in interventions one might use with FTD other than medication that one might not use with Alzheimer's disease? That's a great question. Uh, you know, so if we think about the compulsive behaviors or some of those um, other behavioral symptoms, the key really is to think in terms of changes in the environment what are the changes in the environment that are going to reduce the disruptive nature of the symptom for the individual affected and for the family um, in a supportive way? So with, um, and with a lot of the symptoms, it means really looking at the environment and looking at behavioral interventions. So with the compulsive behaviors, there's nothing that's gonna stop completely somebody who has a real um, drive to wander or to walk these routes or to eat food um, without being able to know when they're satiated. So we need to look at what can we change in the environment and it becomes a really creative process of what's gonna work for this person. So we know that a lot of these symptoms are triggered by uh, visual stimuli. So if somebody has a compulsive eating behavior that involves eating cookies, then you need to really look at how do you reduce the opportunity for them to find the visual stimulation of the cookie to eat. And it seems simple enough, but for family to navigate that or for an assisted living facility to navigate that, it becomes challenging because folks with FTD are resourceful, they're bright, they're very capable in many areas. Um, and so it really becomes a matter of trying an intervention, designing an intervention that's gonna address that particular symptom. How do we hide the cookies? Um, and then be able to look at um, figuring out how do you moderate that and make it possible for folks to implement in a realistic way, whether it's in the home or in the community. So a lot of the, the non-pharmacological interventions are really based on changing the environment or changing the um, support around the person. Another thing that happens, we talk about the scams. So access to computers. Again, folks can be pretty adept at accessing a lot of things on the computer, but where judgment is impaired, their ability to know the difference between a financial scam and some family or friend that's asking for money um, might be impaired a lot. So folks then need to figure out how do you intervene with that person to limit the risk of their exposure in using the computer while potentially also preserving it in ways that would allow the, the individual to still stay engaged sharing emails or um, FaceTiming with family and friends. And so it's a really, um, it truly is a highly individualized process that of course you would do in Alzheimer's disease as well, but the balance and the mix of interventions is key. And also the fact that if memory is not impaired, people will remember, you know? So a lot of times the, someone with FTD on an assisted living facility unit is gonna remember that if you push the red button, the doors open and you can get out. Folks with Alzheimer's disease won't remember that. And so, being cognizant of what's the role of memory in the implementation of these different strategies is also really important. Great, uh, so the next question says, how long has FTD as a diagnosis been recognized and data collected? Hmm, that's a good question too. So um, PICS disease, which is sometimes, you know, was the original term for what we now call frontotemporal degeneration and specifically behavioral FTD. PICS disease was identified in the 1800s right alongside with Alzheimer's disease. And they have an interesting history that way. So we've actually known that there is um, a progressive neurological disease that presents itself as these changes in social comportment or changes in behaviors for a very long time. Um, they're kind of where the dark ages in terms of people paying attention to FTD and research happening. And then um, there was a resurgence again, and I would, uh, and I don't know exactly, I, I'm thinking like the late 70s and 80s, 
where attention started to be tuned in again to the particular nature of these types of dementia as distinguished from Alzheimer's disease. Great. So we are out of time. I apologize for uh, the folks who did not get their questions answered, uh, but on the screen you'll see the number for the helpline as well as an email address. You can reach out um, if you have any further questions for Sharon. And Sharon, I want to thank you for being with us today for this great presentation. Uh, we really enjoyed having you. I want to thank everybody else who participated in today's call. We'd like to welcome you back next month on January 9th at 1 o'clock Eastern Time. We'll have Kendra Faro discussing vision impairment that day. So thank you all for joining Care Connection and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks for having me.